So in manufacturing and specifically in maintenance and repairing operation, we deal every day with heights. Extremely distressing tasks, narrow pipes and very dangerous situation. Vertical surfaces in the open ocean, downstairs the shark. Wholesale environment, more sharks. And of course, harsh environment. We do have thunderstorms, highs, drizzling, hot weather, and extremely corrosive, salty weather. And of course, whole structure that can collapse in a blink of an eye. Now, my question for you is, what do you like not to see in this situation? I can tell you that I would like not to see people in this situation, absolutely. Every year, there are tens of thousands of injuries in the world, and the more we build, the higher is the risk for people. There's nothing to do with the turbine industry and windmill industries. Those are, those are actually the industries where there's highest level of technology embedded. It's actually about people. So if we place human beings in executing dangerous tasks in harsh environment, we cannot avoid the risk of failure. So what we do about that? If you ask me, well, <laughs> I would say, let's place a robot over there. So this idea kind of stood up in my mind in the last years. I try to snoop around and try to understand which were the actual levels of robotic exploitation around in the maintenance repairing operations. And I saw that was little, little poor application and exploitation of robots, mostly for inspection, a little bit of cleaning. So either mobile platforms or drones, but there was actually very little or close to nothing executing actual manufacturing tasks. And that was strange. So what I've done is to try to organize a meeting, I wrap up a bunch of people, expert, extremely expert in the maintenance, and I try to discuss with them, to investigate what was the motivation for that. And their answer was, guys, no way. No way you can build a robot that can integrate the peeling of the painting, the treatment of corrosion, the coating, the cleaning, and other technologies is too complex. And I elaborated the thing and said, well, complex. Challenge accepted. So I went back to my place and I started working with my beautiful team of engineers and experts in robotics, we start trying to envisage and embrace the next generation of robots for our environments. And of course, they were complex, that was right. So we start addressing a number of challenges on the way. First, dexterity. How we let the robot move in order to mirror the human being. Reconfigurability, how the robot needs to evolve to match changes of operating conditions. Robustness, we need to have the robot endure the critical situation, the harsh environment. And of course, self-resiliency. So we are not actually building a robot to help people and then ask people to go down to fix the robot would make sense, you know? So the thing that we were trying to do is to make the robot aware of the surrounding, but at the same time, embed a level of self-awareness in a way the robot could 
process and experience itself and monitor and trace any degrading behavior in a way it could you know, react properly to that. Again, I try to pack a number of things, little slides, few mock-ups, conceptual demos, nothing more. I wanted to double check these things. And I cycled back to the very people I met in the first place. So we sit around this table, I did have my, my presentation, and everything was smooth, actually. I thought that was okay. And then I got that look. You know that look that people give to you, that it says, well, that's cool, but I'll let you know. So again, I went back to the office, I started processing this thing. I really need to understand the motivation behind such reaction. And one day, I called my friend David, extremely interesting past in the MRO sector. And the guy told me, Anna, why don't you just come over the North and Sea? We can take an helicopter and fly over a platform. So you can kind of experience the thing. You can feel and embrace the process. You can talk to people. You can double check the repairing tasks they are carrying out. You can have meetings with the maintenance and operation guys. And I thought in my mind, that's it. I'm going to do that. That's right. I really need to have that. And I didn't do that. <laughs> but yet, I went to play video games. Big success, huh? <laughs> that was actually my fourth time. So I didn't make it. The point was that, if you know that game, it's really, really simple. It's called plank experience. There's this plank, just standing up from the floor, 15 centimeters. But when you wear the VRs, it looks like 100 meters suspended plank on the top of skyscraper. It's terrifying. <gasps> you can feel the hair blown from the fan. There are fake mechanical vibrations. So you really feel that. It looks real. You're not missing a spot from the reality. And then over that, I got my epiphany. I understood the point. So my robots were not good enough for that application. They were just beautiful piece of mechatronics. Nothing more. And I could literally, over that plant, plank, visualize myself in the place, in the maintenance place. So I could visualize the operator running the welding task, but at the same time, feeling the rust, breathing the you know, the hair, just feeling the smell of the water and looking at the wind and the flocks of birds, just in case. So all the senses are focused on that very task. Everything is harmonized for that very task. And that makes sense because it's human preservation from danger. And that was it. I wanted my robot to have that feature. Those specs. I really have, I wanted to have the robots to kind of resemble the human behavior. But then I processed the thing again. I said, no, wait. No way. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to have a robot mirroring a human being. I want to have a robot cooperating with a human being, having this perfect relationship, balanced relationship. 
But of course, when you think about new solution of robots for Arch environment, and you see these robots installed in actual plants, you don't have roboticists over there. They are not skilled in coding and other stuff. They are perfect professionists in the repairing sector. So I needed to have these robots cooperating with humans in a smooth way, in frictionless way. I needed to have the robot to be intuitive. Now, the process of intuition works two ways. On the one hand, you master the robot and the robot perceive your will. On the other hand, the robot executes, but if you want to have really that connection, you need to feel the robot any single bit. So we started by steps, as always. First step, try to have smooth digital interface or literally more human-like interface. This is an application in my lab. So commercial, very good robot. Commercial, extremely good technology. We just working on the interface, the way we relate to the robot. Second step, mastering the robot while it was executing an actual task. This robot is executing a technology that is called cold spray, means without a laser. This technology that starts when I open my hand, literally, it's basically a blasting of metal particles out to a nozzle in supersonic speed with high pressure and extremely high temperature. Very harsh. Right now, this technology is run by human beings with bare hands. It's very complex. So we mastered to have such kind of interaction with the robot. But when you work in a lab, it looks like it works, but it really doesn't. You're not sure at all. So next step was, let's move on site. Let's pick an industrial case where we can really verify whether the robot is a good solution or not. So we picked this surface, vertical wall, to get cleaned and treated from corrosion. And we start working on our next concept of robot. This robot is a mobile platform. It's a platform that can actually climb vertical walls. And it integrates different technologies. So this specific application can actually peel the painting and cold spray, so coat the surface. And the way it works is that this robot moves around this wall, identifies the spots, and somehow try to find the best recipe. Now you might think, well, where's the human being in all this equation? The robot is playing his highs and his ends. So the human operator is actually supervising and also intervening somehow to optimize the process. The difference from the current situation is that the human being is operating safely in a context where his, all his senses are fully on the topic, fully on the repairing tasks. Everything is focused on the application, on optimizing the process, embracing the best process parameters and recipe. So he's actually exploiting his senses for a different purpose. So all those you know, actions that he got used to do to preserve from danger are actually shifted towards a different application. And then can be working and running in a control room on site on the platform, or even hundreds of kilometers away from that site, cooperating with teams of engineers. That is part of my team. So we are running and you know a meeting for trying to cooperate with the guys 
on site to identify the best process recipe. So that looked actually it wor it was working. So again, I packed my thing, the demos, the mockups, the CAD files, and I went back to the very guys I met the first time. And I was this time I was, you know, a little bit more scared, was unsure. But they love it. They were enthusiastic, crazy about that. And we were discussing about the plans for the future. At a point, they asked me, well, Hannah, how are we going to organize our things in the next two, five, ten years? Are they are going to work, the robots, with our equipment, the maintenance equip, just traveling worldwide? And in that very moment, I understood that we were actually working on a very interesting concept, and I would say on a major shift, the value chain. Along with the traditional professions and profiles and skills, we were actually trying to triggering and unfolding new professions. So the traditional maintenance operator, the traditional plant manager and quality manager, were actually start working hands to hands with the process engineer, the guy looking at the defect and the problem and knowing the mechatronics modules available on board and the technology, it could actually build the perfect match. The robot equipper, so the guy selecting the modules from a rack and installing those modules on the top of the robot, as well as the robot maneuver, who is responsible for physically and digitally interacting with the robot. Major shift. And that made me think that we were not just building new robots, we were building new professions. And when it comes to new professions, we really need new skills for the future. The future that we are building all together, it's instrumental to be thought at this time. I would say, let's leave the robot and place the robot to run very difficult tasks, critical tasks in our environment. Let's have that. About ourselves, we need to transcend the danger and amplify our ultimate senses. Thank you very much.